Good morning. My name is Richard Lawson. I'm the Dean of St. John's Cathedral, and it's a pleasure to welcome all of you who are joining us in person here in Dagwell to the Dean's Forum, and all of you who are joining us online, and a warm welcome to you, Pops. Good morning. Hi. How are you doing? It's good to see you. Before I introduce you, I will um, say a prayer, and then we'll dive in. Let us pray. Eternal light, shine into our hearts. Eternal goodness, deliver us from evil. Eternal power, be our support. Eternal wisdom, scatter the darkness of our ignorance. Eternal pity, have mercy upon us. That with all our heart and mind and soul, and we may seek thy face and be brought by infinite mercy to thy holy presence. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Again, a warm welcome to all. We're to have with us Pops Peterson, who is um, a share based artist. And one of his, Pops has done many things as an artist, but one of his most recent projects, which is how we discovered him, and I'll talk about it a bit more in a moment, is a series called Reinventing Rockwell. <clears throat> Launch at the High School of Music in New York. Pops artistic education continued at the Pratt Institute and at Columbia University. He is also a writer. And Pops, I was glad because I, I lived in New York for three years that you, you wrote for The Village Voice. I always loved when I was in seminary grabbing a hard copy of The Village Voice. So you had a great background in, in writing, um, among many other gifts. Welcome, Pops, and good morning. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Where, uh, where is home for you these days? Where are you coming from? I'm living here in Hillsdale, New York, tiny little town, top of a big hill. And uh, it's only one minute away from Massachusetts, where my business is, Seven Salon Spa in Stockbridge. That's wonderful. Well, it's we've just had a, a marvelous uh, week here in Denver. The weather had finally broken. We had a really hot and sadly smoky um, summer, especially the, the last... Mm. It's very, very hot. And so it's, it's finally feels like we live in Colorado again. The weather's broken. It's fall. It's beautiful here. Um, what's the weather on your end? Well, it's been okay. It was really rainy through the summer. Today it's a little cloudy, which is good for, good for photography. Yeah. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> well, as you know, last week in the Dean's Forum, we had Laura James who is um, based in the Bronx. And Laura's, Laura is, is undoubtedly a, a religious artist in, in an obvious sense. Much of her artwork takes as its theme a story from the gospel, a story from the Hebrew skip, scriptures, or a, um, a saint from Christian tradition. You, every now and then, occasionally will have an obviously religious um, theme in one of your paintings. I can think of a couple. You also are, and you are a, a deeply religious thinker, though, in a, in a subtle sense. A lot of your paintings are visionary. A lot of your paintings have to do with looking below um, the surfaces. How would you, though, describe your work? Well, I always try to express an emotion. And lately, I've been also trying to make points, sometimes political points. Um, and actually the political work is what brought me into the limelight. So I've been trying to focus on that because uh, I feel that I really have been reaching people and hopefully, you know, changing their view a bit and, and improving their lives. So uh, it's been an incredible breakthrough for me. And, uh, you know, I've been working as an artist for over 50 years. So to finally come through and really strike a chord with the public has been really gratifying and I'm really inspired. And I feel like I'm just beginning. Uh, that's, that's a good feeling. Our title for your class is Painting a World Where Everyone Belongs. Painting a World Where Everyone Belongs. <clears throat> Let, let's talk about Rockwell and then we'll talk about your series, Reinventing Rockwell. You have a, a really fascinating and eerie relationship with Rockwell. Telling us about th this history that you have. Well, I do have a little uh, animation about it. If you want to show the PowerPoint, or I can just tell you about it. Is the PowerPoint? Can I show the PowerPoint now? 
Okay, great. So um, Norman Rockwell was actually the first artist whose name I knew or whose style I could recognize. And just through happenstance, I wound up doing pictures that looked like Rockwell's and I ran with it and, and started reinventing them. But it wasn't until after I'd been doing it for quite some time that I realized that we had a really kind of a psychic connection. So here is America. Here's the little part of America where I came from, New York State. Here's their New York City. And... Um, up in New York City, this little part of Manhattan here is uptown. And this is where Norman Rockwell was born. And then here I am where I was born, just about a mile apart in, in Harlem. And then when he was a teenager, he moved up to St. Nicholas Avenue. And as a teenager, I studied on St. Nicholas at the High School of Music and Arts. So we went to the exact same street and I was there to, to study painting. And that was only three quarters of a mile. So then we go 150 miles up to North Massachusetts to a little place called Stockbridge where Norman Rockwell got his last home, number eight South Street. And I just happened to buy number seven South Street where I put my business, Seven Salon Spa. So the distance between the two of us now is only 25 yards. <laughs> and then of course we wound up together in the Norman Rockwell Museum. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, it was uh, quite a shock to me when I realized that actually his home was right outside my window because the first thing I did um, was just totally by accident. It was just something that kind of looked like, let me see if I can show you this here. Okay, so I was doing a blog which needed cartoons and I hadn't done any drawing in 35 years, but I was doing this, was kind of a body sex advice blog and I had a, a post called, how does one get laid in New York City? And I said, I can do this, I can do this. I went to art school. So if you can see that little stick figure, that's the first one I did after 35 years. And they, the cartoons just developed and became a more and more elaborate. And I actually started getting commissions to do portraits of people. But this is what happened by accident. I did a story called, Can My Gay Relationship Last for 30 Years? And I featured my friends, Donna and Jamie, and I looked at that and I said, wow, what about it? What is this? What about this looks to me like Norman Rockwell? And I wonder if I could do anything like that in per on purpose. So then I did this, Nick's Passion, just to get the style of it and see if I could you know, do something like that on purpose. Right. And I was happy with it. So then I decided to redo my favorite pictures. This is Sailor on Leave. And this is the first recreation that I did. And I call it Sailor's Best Friend. And I went on to do The Runaway, which my version right. is called Stockbridge Fire Department to the Rescue. I took his Freedom from Want and did my own version, which I call Thanksgiving Gay Dinner. And then This is the Problem We All Live With, which I did it's um, the problem persists. And this is Ruby Bridges, instead of going to being escorted to school in New Orleans, she's walking through the, the rubble left after the Ferguson riots. And that was a very emotional yeah. work for me because I realized 50 years had gone by since this picture was done and we're still living through the same thing. When I was, uh, when I was in high school, I had to go to school in Harlem when the riots were happening. So when I did this, I was totally crying. I cried for about the five or six hours. I did it so quickly. I had actually planned to uh, hire a little girl and get a dress made. And, and I didn't know how I would stage it, but I was going to use a model. But when this happened, I just had to get it out. And it really struck a chord with um, the public. And uh, I was on my way. I, it, I got 
I, I get very upset sometimes when I'm talking about things. I'm very emotional. I might break out crying before this hour is over. Oh, you're fine. But um, <laughs> I realize that my power comes from the depth of emotion that I do feel. I feel it so strongly that I can put it into onto a canvas and other people will respond in kind. So can, um, can we, do you mind if we go back to something? No. So I want to, something you said piqued my interest. Rockwell was born in Harlem. He was born actually just South of Harlem in yeah. on, on Amsterdam Avenue. And it was just called it's uptown, you know, the upper West yeah. side. So but did, then did, when he was a teenager, he did move to Harlem. Harlem was originally a white neighborhood. Yeah. And then they decided to bring the black people into it. That might have had to oh. do with um, destroying the black neighborhood that became Central Park. Yeah. I don't know. But um, yeah, we actually, he, he was, as a, as a child, as a teenager, he lived in Harlem. Then he moved up to Westchester when he was like a young adult, or an older yeah. teenager. Is there, and I do not know Rockwell, I, I know sort of the popular Rockwell and, and the pictures that you've shown from him. Did, did Rockwell um, address any of the social issues in the three, or was it usually a sentimentalized version? Okay, well, you know, as it was common in the day, black people, you know, we're talking 20s, 30s, 40s. 50s black people are not supposed to be seen at all right. basically unless they were your maid or your liveryman or a pullman porter or whatever and norman rockwell had to stick to this to these um orders just don't don't do anything different um but he's a very empathetic caring person and he had a vision of a loving world that he really wanted to express Every now and again, he would slip in a black character. Um, you can see a black person working on this picture of a working on the Statue of Liberty. There's a little, little, little black character at the top. Mm. But eventually, after 47 years of working for the Saturday Evening Post and just doing the illustrations that he was told to do, he'd had enough and he went out on his own. And that's when he did really striking um, pictures about civil rights um this the problem we all live with is one but he also did murder in mississippi he did um several things that were about brotherhood a bro uh, uniting the world and equality and uh if he hadn't done that i'm fairly certain there would be no norman rockwell museum in Stockbridge because he would have been just an illustrator who did what somebody told him to do and paid him to do. He um, never would have expressed his own passion. Interesting. We discovered you pops in 2020 when the Denver Art Museum feature freedom from what? I can't breathe, which is from your larger series, which is reinventing Rockwell. Tell us about the series please. Yes. So as I said, I was, I had all of a sudden just out of the blue did something that looked like a Rockwell. And I thought it'd be fun to go around town and just recreate the Rockwells with modern day dress and hairstyles and technology. And I thought it would just be fun for the community. And my dream was that, oh my gosh, maybe they will give me a little show in the basement of the Norman Rockwell Museum. I could have my friends over and that would be fun. And that was the extent of what I wanted to do. But to my surprise, after I'd done these images where I featured, for instance, this is um, Willie Gillis goes to college. Willie Gillis was a, a character of his who went to the war and wound up studying on the GI Bill. I did my version with the Latino who went to Afghanistan and he gets gets to go to the war on the GI Bill. But as you can see, he's lost a foot. Uh. And then this was uh, Freedom from Fear, which Rockwell did to raise money for the war effort back in you know World War II, where he's proving that in America, we're all safe. 
because we're the greatest. Over there, they've got bombs falling on their houses, but we have freedom from fear. So I wanted to do my own version where I showed that even today, in some parts of town, some people never really have that luxury of feeling the freedom of fear. And then here's St. Joan. I mean, this is uh, the girl in the mirror where the pre-pubescent or pubescent young girl looks at herself in the mirror with the picture of Jane Russell in the movie magazine. And she wants to, you know, one day be as sexy and glamorous as a movie star. But in my version, I have a young lady who sees herself in the mirror as a Boy Scout. Mm -hmm. And I call this St. Joan. So I put my own take on all these pictures and all of a sudden I was basically recruited by the civil rights community. They saw the fact that I, that they saw a healing power in these pictures because like myself and many people who were raised on Norman Rockwell and also just American, you know, iconography in general, there were no black people. Now there's black people. Now there's trans people. Now there are women who were in roles of authority. Now a woman has a voice. Um, and they gave me an award. <laughs> and they made me the artist in residence of the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination, which is a title I've held for the past like five, six years. And then they actually brought me out and said, oh, you got to give a speech. So then that launched my uh, speaking career, which actually is the most rewarding part of this whole experience for me because I, I get to talk to young kids about the people who went before them, who, try, who fought and, and just worked in their daily lives for equality. And I start with Harriet Beecher Stowe, who is white, and I go up to Josephine Baker and Gordon Parks and, and Don Shirley and many other people who were not taught in schools. And actually there's a movement not to teach people about the other people who worked for civil rights. So I'm in a great position where I can not only go and tell um, about these other people and the wonderful works they did um, just as artists and civil rights advocates, but I get to tell my own story because I actually lived through the civil rights era. I mean, you might think I look less old than I do, but I'm a senior citizen. <laughs> No. And I was there, you know, I was there when Martin Luther King mm. was assassinated. And I know what that was like. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Pops, God bless you. These are moving and provocative and full. Um, before we continue with our, our questions, I'll just say to everyone who's gathered here in Bagwell or anyone who's joining us online, please put questions in the chat. If you're in here in Dagwell, just raise your hand and I'll get to you. Some questions are welcome um, at, at any moment. Your freedom from what I can't breathe and, and the phrase I can't breathe, you were thinking about this phrase before the death, God rest his soul, of Edward Floyd. Well, yes, because when I did the original, it was right after Eric Gardner had been murdered by policemen because he was selling loose cigarettes. And at the time, it was a great outrage and it was the story of the day. So when I did my version of Freedom from Fear, I put I Can't Breathe on the newspaper as the newspaper headline. When in Rockwell's newspaper, they were talking about the Blitzkrieg in Europe, but in mine, I put, I can't breathe. So um, it, when it first came out, it struck a chord with people. This is something where people will be looking at it in a museum and they will actually cry. And then they'll say, oh my God, I never thought of it this way. Yeah. You never thought that somebody might not even be at peace in their own home. This is what this picture says. Yeah. So, um, ironically, six years later, the Rockwell tour came up, my picture was included, and we actually did a, a tour with 40 original pieces based on freedom and Rockwell's version of freedom that we curated from over a thousand entries nationwide. And when the show got to Denver, to the Denver Art Museum, 
they didn't want the whole show. They said, oh, we'll show one. And they picked mine. Mm. Well, that was like being struck by lightning that out of a thousand entries, they choose mine to be in the show. But what really, really nearly made me faint was that six days later, George Floyd was murdered and he said the exact same thing. I can't breathe. Yeah. It was, uh, I still can't. Yeah. Yeah. Th this piece just, I mean, it brings us, I mean, anybody with a heart is paying attention. It brings us to our knees. Um, and the fact that you had that phrase before George Floyd's death on here is just incredible. Um, yeah, but not but only before course, George. It's only I got to always Gardner. remember that this is after Eric Gardner was yeah. murdered also by the cops. And then you discover there's a dozen other black right. men on video saying, I can't breathe, yeah. who are being killed by the cops. It's just a horrendous situation. It, it, it is. And it's also... Um, you know, obviously I'm a, a preacher um, and I, you know, immediately one of the things that resonates for me with that phrase is breath in the Bible, which is sacred. Um, so you've got breath as, as the wind of God over creation in the beginning in Genesis 1. You've got the Holy Spirit um, is breath that's within every person. Do you think, as an artist, do you think much about that image of, of, of the spirit as this animating biblical force uh, throughout creation that's within each person? Well, I firmly believe we all are spirit. And not only that, we're all part of the same spirit. And I, even though I don't always believe in re in religious doctrines and that everything that's said in the Bible is exactly true. I mean, we know it can't be exactly true when it contradicts itself. I mean, it says mm -hmm. that Jesus is born in one place and then it says Jesus is born in another place. So it's, you, you need to interpret on your own. But I've always felt a deep connection with the universe and I've seen in my life so many times how if I will put a call to the universe, the universe will answer me. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Everything that I do, in my heart, I really believe in brotherly love. I, I believe in people getting along, not only just civil rights, but just day to day, just neighborly, being good to one another. I believe if everybody would just treat other people the way they want to be treated, the world would be a paradise. But it's not. And... Uh, it's up to us to try the goodness in ourselves and, and share the goodness that we have. And from a young age, I knew that I had a great deal of joy in my, in my soul and that the greatest joy that I got was when I shared it by doing a picture or writing a song or writing something, but to be, to give myself artistic freedom expression and to have it shared with even one person or an audience or you know, or a million people on something that I that I've written that got published. But that's my I believe that's my purpose is to share my feelings and to record my views yeah. for so other people can benefit from the path I've I've walked. Where is your your art? And you have so many things. So you you may be in the midst of a kind of a fallow period, but where, where is your art headed, or where are you these days as an artist? Well, I'm very excited now about a mural project that I'm doing for the city of Pittsfield. It's going to be huge and colorful. Huh. It's based on the Ruby Bridges image that was in my um, the Ferguson image that I showed yeah. you and the problem we all live with. It's based on that, but I have Ruby like. She's going to be like 28 feet high and she's all rainbow colors. And, and uh, that's going to mean a lot because the real Ruby Bridges, who I've never talked to, but she helped to change the world. Yeah. She was a great inspiration back in, you know, 50 years ago. And I want to keep her legacy alive and bring it to children 
and make people happy and understand that no, no matter what adversity the world gives you, you can, you can walk. You can educate yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And you can improve yourself and the world. Just keep on walking. Mm. Uh, someone just chimed in and, and, and mentioned that you've got a piece called Sunday Morning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let me show you Sunday Morning. I love this picture. It's that'd be fitting for us who would hear. Okay, so Sunday morning is a photo of my preacher, his husband, and their son Jake. And they're about to go to church on Sunday morning. Um, and I was inspired to do this because the church basically it became a big part of my life again about a year ago. Um, we were talking about belonging, and quite frankly, I, I have to honestly say that I felt like I didn't belong in a church. I was raised in the congregational church. I would go every Sunday. I sang in the choir. And as a child, it was just a place to go to, you know, just hear music and learn things and be with people who are nice and wear your nice clothes and it was a beautiful refuge, and that's why, you know, many, many people go to church just so they can experience a bit of joy and peace in a week. And then as I got older and realized my sexuality and the way the church and especially the black church considered homosexuals, I felt, you know, you know, later for you guys. I know I don't need this. I'm a good person. I have a good soul. I can see through you. I know you contradict yourself in your Bible. And I know that God is in my heart. So I, I can pray on my own and later, right? Especially when I it was in my 20s, I went to a church in Harlem and the preacher was saying, oh, we have to cure homosexuals. I said, mm. you know, I, we don't. So mm. I rejected the church. But then later, when I moved up here, not only did I move right across the street from Norman Rockwell's house, I also moved right down the block from the nearest congregational church, you know, and that's not the most popular church, but here it is, it's a 30 second drive. So I went on Easter just because I wanted to when I would be crying through the whole service. And I did that a couple of years. And then when COVID came out, I was watching on YouTube all by myself at home and I'm crying and crying and crying and I can't understand why. I'm going, I miss my mother, I miss church, whatever, but I couldn't understand why am I crying and crying and crying. So I was watching these sermons every week, totally devastated by the end of each um, sermon. And the preacher, actually, I made a donation. The preacher reached out to me and said he wanted to talk to me. And I said, well, maybe I could talk to him. He can help me out with this. But even before I talked to him, I realized why I was crying was that even though as a young adult, I had rejected the church, the fact was the church had rejected me. They said, you're not good enough. You're shameful. We don't want you unless you change. And, and so I felt like I, left, I didn't have a home to go to. Right. In your mind and your memories, you want to go back home. You can't be with your mother. Your mother's dead. Your house is, you know, unrecognizable that you were grown into. and You're not welcome there anyway. But you can walk into church and you can hear the songs that you heard when you were a kid. You can go through the same rituals. And it's like going home. Yeah. But home didn't want me anymore. Mm. But through the grace of God and the luck of the universe, there I was. 30 seconds away from the congregational church and the preacher was gay mm. and that's so this, i went and i told him yeah, yeah that's that's brent damro reverend brent damro and his husband john and their son jake so i had this inspiration that i really wanted to you know celebrate the fact that gay people love yeah gay people have families Gay people go to church and we are here. We've always been here, but we haven't been seen. Mm. So even though this is not an update 
of any kind of a Rockwell. I've, I've infused the Rockwell style to become my own new style and to, to use it for my own voice. Yeah. And this is one of my, my favorite pictures I've ever done. Well, that's just um, incredible. And especially when paired with your story, thank you for sharing that. It makes me think about, um, you know, artists see things the rest of us don't see. And faith, especially the Christian faith or the Jewish faith is, is largely or often about that. Looking below the surfaces, paying attention to it all, what's missed, what's misunderstood. So there's something deeply religious to return to where we started about art. Would you leave us, show us another image as, as we um, wrap up? Where, where would you like sure. to? Sure. Well, let me show you some of my other originals. As I said, I, you know, I was drafted into the civil rights community and I find a great, excuse me, great deal of joy and satisfaction and giving voice to people who don't always have their own voice. So um, as the artist in residence of the Massachusetts Commission of Discrimination, against discrimination, um, they wanted me to do my own freedom because Norman Rockwell has four freedoms and they wanted me to do my own freedom. They said freedom from shame. And I didn't know what in the world that would mean or how to express it. But then one day I went into a dinner party and I met a young man named Dylan Bader. And he was just, you know, just very unassuming, nice, good looking young guy at the table talking with his sister. And I was there for a good 20, 30 minutes before I even realized that he was missing half of his arm, half of his right arm. And I'm talking with him and he's telling us how he plays on a hockey team. And, and I said, oh my God, what, this is the most, this is a brave person. This guy is a hero. And he has no shame about who he is or the person that God made him to be. And, um, you know, when you're different and you walk into a room, people will look at you. If, you, if there's something wrong with you physically, they look at you askance. And this is what I know Dylan has to deal with every single day of his life. But he doesn't let him get it. It doesn't let him get it down, get him down. So I wanted to stage him as a hero that I see him as. And I put him in his hockey outfit and I staged him as a, just having won a big championship and the champagnes being poured over his head. But he's a champion of life, not just of hockey. And uh, I was, the reception of this picture was just totally explosive. I had no idea the Massachusetts office a disability saw it and they just loved it. And I said, oh, we're going to have a statewide competition based on your picture. So they did. And we, we got um, submissions from all over the state from disabled people or people who just were sympathetic to the disabled community. And uh, we actually did stage a really nice exhibition. We had no idea what was going to, where it was going to be shown. We said, oh, a college will do it or an office building somewhere. And it actually wound up in the Massachusetts State House in the wow. main gallery, and it was a it was just really one of the most amazing days of my life because we had a reception. You know, all the artists came in, and there were all kinds of dignitaries, you know, mayors and stuff like that. And these people who walk with a limp, or they're blind, or they are in a wheelchair, or something else, you know they have a disability that makes them different and makes people look at them as askance, but they got to walk up to the podium mm -hmm. with everybody looking at them for a good reason, you know, and they got to be proud that people were looking at them for what they'd done and for who they were. Yeah. And I've never had a better day in my life. Mm. There's a video on my website if you want to check it out, but I got it. It's really nice commendation from the governor, and that was great. Then I went on to do a comm commemoration of the Women's March. This is called I'm With Her. The Women's March was a huge deal. There was, there's another Women's March today, I think, about um, uh, the Texas ruling against abortion. But back then, we were all upset about somebody who was elected. But I just thought there was something happening here in Washington, DC, when actually 
there was a women's march happening in more than 600 cities mm. around the world. So I put the names of the cities in the ground and in the rainbow, and I used famous landmarks to show that it was a worldwide event. And I have I had 45 people came to my studio to be photographed one by one, one day, and I put together this image. Um, in the front row, we have representations, representations of women who have fought for equality through time. So we have Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, the um, suffragettes, a flapper girl, Rosie the Riveter, Rosa Parks, a flower girl, and a modern American mother, mm. all fighting for liberty. Um, oh, gosh, this one was difficult. This is called Are We Safe? And it was a commemoration of the horrible Las Vegas mass shooting yeah. several years ago. And I was inspired to do this because, you know, there were like 56 people murdered by one guy. And I saw on the news, a cop was escorting two women away from the carnage and the cop was crying. You know, they had escaped being killed, but they were blood spattered and the cop was even overcome. And <laughs> it really struck a nerve with me because not long before that, I had been at Fenway Park at the Lady Gaga concert just having a good time. And that guy was scoping the place out to see if maybe he wanted to kill everybody here at Fenway. So it could have been me. Yeah. Yeah. So it's called, Are We Safe? Yeah. Pops, I think one of the things you do that is just so powerful is you, you, you confront us not with ideas as much as with real people. Is that a part of what's going on in your art? Well, yeah, it's, I'm all about reality these days. I spent, you know, as a younger guy, I was about inventing things and dreaming things up and saying, wouldn't this be funny if, but right now I've realized that the truth is the most powerful thing in the world. And reality is the most, wonderful thing in the world and sharing reality and sharing truth is what the only thing that is going to heal the world. Mm. So um, from now on, I, I'm, I'm not really doing just, you know, abstract or landscapes or things like that. Not, not now. I, I'm trying to speak for people who don't have a voice. I'm trying to share ideas that I think could, could uplift the world. Yeah. And save the world, you know, and it seems like a very lofty thing and a self-aggrandizing thing for, for an artist to say. But I'm only reflecting on what people have have told me about what they've done for them. And, you know, the, the incredible write ups up, the incredible press coverage I've had and 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 the, 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 the time that people spend in front of my my artwork, it makes me know that this is real. And I just need to own it and be proud of it and continue what I'm doing. Well, um, one of the things that, that also comes to mind, and I'll um, wrap up this before we thank you, is Christianity, a large part of that story, God becoming flesh in Jesus Christ, the incarnation, God joining us in reality, going on that long journey that all of us have where we can find where our home is. And, and your, your artwork is also incarnational. Um, so I thank you for it. I also thank you for sharing so generously of your own story with all of us. We're grateful. You are a very important American artist. God bless you and God bless your work. And thank you so much for joining us. Can I just say one more thing, please? Of course you can, Pops. You get the uh, last one of the word. greatest things I've got going now is that I... I'm on the board of a local art school and they named the scholarship fund after me. And I've been raising funds so that underprivileged kids in my neighborhood can go to an art class and learn how to connect with their own vision and, and have a, a space where they can go and escape from the world and also express what they feel in their hearts. And um, 
It's, you know, even a wonderful affluent place like the Berkshires, there are kids who don't have paper. They don't have pencils when they go home. I was outraged when I went to an art class and I brought some construction paper to share with the kids and they said, oh, wow, I don't have any paper. I'll take some home, you know? And so um, there's a scholarship fund. There's a link on my website. If anybody wants to make any little contribution, it'll help a, a young kid to um, just find some solace within their own heart. Of course. Pops, thank you so much. God bless you. And until we meet again, and I look forward to it. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. For all of you who are joining us online or in person, um, we will have our Sunday service of Holy Eucharist at 10.30 a.m. So have a cup of coffee, prepare, and we'll see you in a few minutes. Take care.